Good evening. Welcome to the regularly scheduled meeting of the Jefferson County Board of Education on Monday, September 23rd. And do we have a guest to lead us in the pledge this evening? Yes, I want to introduce Mrs. Susan Bigwood from the Blue Ridge Complex. She has a crew here this <laughs> evening, and I'll let her introduce the crew here, and we're happy that you're here this evening. Well, it is my great pleasure to introduce two families from Blue Ridge Campus, uh, the Kirby's and the Noblets. So we'll have Maddie Kirby and her brother Grayson Kirby. And then we have, um, and Maddie is in fifth grade and Grayson is in second. Then we have the Novel family of three girls. And we have Jordan who's in kindergarten and Brooklyn who's in second and Peyton who's in fifth. And the parents of Grayson and Maddie are Travis and Amber Kirby and the parents of Jordan, Brooklyn, and Peyton are Charles and Bill Monopoly. And we really appreciate them being able to come this evening and help lead the pledge. So if you guys would just say hello. Good It's that time of year again. We're going to kick off uh, the recognition of our incredible uh, staff and employees and the folks who, uh, who make it happen, uh, sometimes right in front of a classroom, sometimes it's behind the scenes, but uh, every day out there working for the students of Jefferson County. Uh, it's the One Jefferson Awards this year. We're, uh, we're changing around a bit. Uh, the idea that we are all One Jefferson working towards the common goal of uh, supporting kids academically, keeping them safe, and supporting their social emotional needs. So we're going to recognize uh, a service person and a professional this evening. Uh, some of you may have seen the news surrounding our uh, service person, uh, Heather Pindell. She's one of our outstanding bus operators and uh, Joyce White, who is our interim deputy superintendent of operations, uh, has supervised Heather for a long time. Uh, Heather is not here, which is pretty common, as I understand it, for uh, the type of person she is, but she deserves incredible recognition for, for the second year in a row organizing the Stuff a Bus event at our Walmart in Charlestown. Her uh, efforts getting together some of her coworkers, her friends, and other volunteers, they managed to stuff more than 160 backpacks this year that went to kids in need in our school system. Uh, Heather was relentless in making sure that people knew about the event leading up to it and then celebrating it afterwards. Uh, and we'll make sure she gets this. And uh, Joyce wanted to say a couple things about Heather as well. You know, wherever you see Jefferson County children, you'll find Heather Pendell. She uh, has not only done stuff a bus and for two years saw need and packed backpacks, but you know she sees that kids get meals when school's not in session. And she has such a wonderful spirit of volunteerism. Uh, she definitely needs to be recognized. She's probably out volunteering right now, knowing Heather. <laughs> But I just wanted to uh, say a few words about her because she's one of the best driver, bus drivers that we have. We could clone Heather, and uh, her children just love her, and the Jefferson County children are better off because of Heather and her service here in Jefferson County and to Jefferson County Schools. So it's a pleasure to work with Heather. And how many parents do we have out here in the audience? You all know what the difference uh, a bus driver can make for uh, your kid. My son rode the bus the first time and then wouldn't have it in any other way. He started to ride home as well because he loved his bus driver. And uh, bus drivers like Heather uh, set, the, set the standard for that. So we'll make sure that she gets this recognition. And I would like to uh, welcome Cindy Jones, who's the Director of Pupil Services, and Nancy McManus, who is Principal at Shepherdstown Elementary School, uh, so that they can recognize our professional one Jefferson winner, uh, Sheila Angelo Caffrey. Good evening. I am excited to be here tonight. I would like to honor Sheila Angelo Caffrey. She's a special educator currently at Shepherd Elementary School. 
She, to me, represents everything that goes on in Jefferson County that we don't always see. She is the unsung hero. And I guess I say this because I think I asked him back in July, when can we do this, when can we do this? Because I knew this was happening, and she didn't know I knew this was happening, but I did know. So what really caught us on top of being there, working her 12 hours a day like you know your teachers do, um, she purchased, we have currently, I don't know if you're aware of it, that we have a program for um, intervention called SPIRE, which is an orton gillingham paid um, program that we are implementing throughout the county. We've done it slowly, things cost, so we have slowly moved it out and we were excited that we had one training in the beginning of the year. Well, what we didn't know is that she was part of the pilot and intervention. So for her, she purchased with her own money six nine thousand dollars worth of spire over the summer for the curriculum she attended a one-day training in maryland she made friends with the spire representative from maryland who has sent her access to webinar training a five hundred dollar value for her to view for additional training he also was working on getting her six additional sets of classroom materials for one to five for her to use with her students this man and this company were moved as well by her willingness to purchase all of this out of her own money. She goes above and beyond not only this, but again, it's something that we never hear of. We never see it, and I, I can't be more pleased. We're honored. You say our name and her department, and Erica, who is our IEP compliance coordinator, down to your period and comma, and how your sentence is structured in that IEP. She's, her, her voice this morning, I said your name, and she said, yeah, she rocks. <laughs> she walked out the door. So I can't say it more. This is Sheila Angelo Caffrey. She is the miracle teacher that I am blessed to work with this year. <laughs> Sheila is the first teacher to arrive each day in that school building. She's also usually the last teacher <laughs> to leave the building. I often leave late, and she's still there working hard with the students in mind, this lady is dedicated to her students. She is always thinking about how can I make them learn? How can I get them to be the very best they can be? And I am very honored and pleased to say I've only worked with her a short period of time, but I'm so impressed by her efforts, her dedication, and her huge heart. Besides all that wonderful part <laughs> of this lady, the very first time I met her, she started talking to me and I thought I was home, back in New York. <laughs> She's got the thickest New York accent. <laughs> she really does. And sometimes when she's saying things, I go, oh my goodness, I'm, I'm home, I'm home. And sometimes she says things and I think people don't understand what she's saying because of that accent. And sometimes it's strong. But I am just very privileged and honored to work with this fine educator. And I look forward to working with her in the year ahead, but in the years ahead. Thank you. Right? Thank you very so thank much. You very thank much, you very much, Sheila. Thank you. Thank you. Come back here. <laughs> oh, no, we get to honor you some more. Oh, my. Okay, you get to, we got to take a picture. picture with the board? This is yours. Oh, okay. oh goodness. <laughs> I'm going to stand over there next to Mr. Skinner and your slide in a little bit. Thank you. Um, to ease, if you don't mind, just one moment, just to ease a few minds of the audience members, if we could have a motion to move the consent agenda items to now. So move six, number six, and, or I'm sorry, number seven, to right now between two and three. 
All in favor? Aye. Opposed? All right, so now we'll address the consent agenda. Are there any changes, additions, or deletions to the consent agenda? No, ma'am, I recommend approval as submitted. All right, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? So moved. Second. Any questions? All in favor of the consent agenda? Aye. Aye. Opposed? <coughs> Thank you. All right, so that takes care of the consent agenda. Moving back up to number three, the presentation, the review of the 2019 summer maintenance list. Good evening. I'm here to present information about the 2019 maintenance requests. The summer months are a pivotal time for the maintenance department because it allows us to be in the classrooms uh, without disturbing instruction. It's always our goal to provide our students with a safe and appropriate learning environment. I came on board with maintenance department as of July 9th, 2019, and my first active duty was to analyze the summer requests by the schools and prioritize what we could reasonably get accomplished while man minding manpower and budget. I identified 113 requests that we were able to accomplish 96 of those requests from July 9th to uh, the beginning of school, giving us a completion percentage of 84.9%. Some projects were large and required contracting the work out to vendors, while others were handled in-house by our maintenance department. On top of those 113 requests, we also had 779 total work orders submitted uh, through our daily work order system from 617 uh, until 819. We completed 682 of those work orders, giving us a completion percentage of 87.5%, while the remaining 12.5% are still in progress. Moving forward, I myself will have more time to obtain the summer requests, prioritize their requests, set replacement schedules, and coordinate what projects would need contracted out that's too large for our maintenance department to handle in-house. This additional planning time and scheduling should allow us for a higher completion percentage for the summer of 2020. Um, giving that, I have two recommendations to help us achieve that goal. One being uh, a additional summer painter. S painting in the schools was the most requested summer request from our schools. It gives our buildings a fresh and updated look. It can make a world of difference for a hallway, <coughs> office, gym, or classroom. If the environment is inviting, then the students and staff will be more comfortable within that environment for learning to take place. My second recommendation would be additional funds for maintenance vehicles and the spraying of the underbody of those vehicles. We have aging vehicles, but we do not have a, even a sufficient number of vehicles to be able to send our staff out to complete jobs individually. We have 16 maintenance workers and 12 vehicles total, but of those 12, one is a dump truck and one is a flatbed. So that leaves us, leaves us with 10 appropriate vehicles to mobilize employees around the county. Of those 10, we currently have three that are in need of replacement in the near future due to the possibility of them not passing the state inspection this year. Those three vehicles include a 2002 F-250 pickup, a 2002 Ford flatbed, and a 2003 F-150 pickup. Additional vehicles would allow us to be able to send more staff out individually across the county to complete jobs that only require one person. This would increase our efficiency and ability to address a higher number of work orders in the same amount of time. By increasing our efficiency for completing the work orders, we would be ensuring our school's needs are being addressed so students could be in a safe and appropriate learning environment. Also, extending the life of our new vehicles is a subject of interest because the majority of our vehicles are used for snow prep and snow removal. The use of the brine spray and salt spreaders during the winter months accelerates the deterioration of our vehicle's frames and bodies. This type of deter deterioration is the cause of our vehicles possibly not passing inspection this year. The spraying of the underbody of any new vehicles moving forward would extend the life of our vehicles, frames, and bodies. This too is important because not only would the additional vehicle increase efficiency for work orders, but it would also increase the efficiency for plowing snow. 
This in turn would lower the amount of man hours needed for plowing our facilities and also allows more time to ensure the safety of our staff and students. I don't have any questions for me in regards to our list. I'd like to thank you for all your hard work. First of all, and uh, second of all, um, I appreciate the communication that you have had with Joyce and us as well. So, thank you. I'd like to offer the same thing as Mark. I, I think that you guys have done a fantastic job this year. Uh, it's been more productive than uh, some other other times, and uh, it, it, it really shows. So, thank you. Congratulations, and we'll support you all we can. Thanks, sir. Any other questions for me? Thank you. Thank you. Madam Superintendent, any comments this evening? Mm -hmm. right. Approval of the minutes. Is there a motion to approve the minutes from the regular board meeting held September 9th, 2019? Second. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? jump down to number 12 oh nope sorry uh, citizens comments number six first we have Barbara Fuller followed by Jesse Shanholtz I want to thank you first of all for approving line item 23 um, my name is Barbara Fuller and I wanted to speak on behalf of Mrs. Kogel she actually taught my son. Um, I had the pleasure of uh, Mrs. Uh, Kogel's experience with my son. He was slower than normal and he was in Mrs. Tomasic's class, but at the end of every day, he would manage to make his way back to their combined classroom. And looking forward five years from him being in her class, he is now an honor student in English. She is exemplary and she deserves all the support from our board and our parents that she could possibly get. And I was, I was absolutely flabbergasted that five weeks into the school year that this could happen, but I'm so very happy that you've made the decision to keep her where she is. Thank you. And after Jesse, we have Judy York. I just want to say thank you for giving us the opportunity. I'm speaking on the same um, item regarding Ms. Kogel, and I just, not to belabor since we've already gotten the positive outcome that we wanted, um, I just want to say that I do support any action that would ensure the least amount of disruption to the students this early in the school year. That was my main concern as a parent was my daughter. I do love Ms. Kogel, just the short amount of time that we've had with her. My daughter wrote, the most wonderful letter to her regarding not just how much she liked her, but she liked her teaching style, and she really responded to it. So um, I thank you for the, the positive outcome to that. And then I just wanted to say that I hope that moving forward, that maybe this is an opportunity for us to realize that um, with the issues of low enrollment, that maybe being a little bit more proactive. I mean, that was m my biggest reaction was that being in the, at the beginning of the the quarter um, that may be anticipating that um, in the future would be better for students. So, thank you. And after Judy, we have Rachel Howie. Hi, uh, Judy York. I'm here in support of addition, the addition of the new special ed position at Charlestown Middle School. Because it's my understanding that uh, adding this position is going to help the county avoid this mid-year shuffle that we've been worried about. Because um, that shuffle of teachers is going to have a disruptive impact on multiple schools, classrooms, teachers, and students in, within the county. Uh, most specifically, my daughter is a student in Ms. Kogel's classroom at Shepherdstown Middle. And um, Ms. Kogel is one of um, the teachers that would be impacted, as we've stated. This is my fourth year as a parent at Shepherdstown Middle, and I know Ms. Kogel as a talented and passionate ELA student, both of my son and my daughter in their honors um, English classes. and. 
she just lights the students up. I saw her at the parent teacher night, and uh, we bought a book for her classroom. And I, you know, they're just very excited about these things, and it's great to see. Um, in middle school, the English language and arts program, the ELA, is two periods of day. And so that's like a quarter of a child's school day. Um, if she's removed, and Ms. Kogel is removed as, uh, from Shepherdstown Middle, over 100 students will be required to reshuffle their uh, classrooms with teachers who potentially don't have the experience to teach um, the ELA program, especially at the honors level, um, or at any level, really. Uh, so I appreciate the recent communication from Dr. Gibson on this matter, which referenced the new special ed position at Charlestown Middle School as a possible solution to resolve the larger countywide issue. But my hope is that in the future, mid-year teacher transitions can be planned and carefully thought out so that a change in teachers, if it does need to be made for budgetary or other reasons, can be incorporated, incorporated within the school year between grading periods and not cause so much disruption. Thank you. Hello. Thank you for this opportunity to address the board. Um, my name is Rachel Halley. I'm a parent of one Jefferson County Schools graduate and one Shepherdstown Middle sixth grader. Um, I've lived in Jefferson County for 10 years and I'm a passionate supporter of public schools. Um, I'm here this evening along with Judy and Jesse to support the creation of the position at Charlestown Middle to avoid losing Mrs. Kogel at SMS. Um, the first letter we received explained that because of under enrollment, a teacher was going to have to be redeployed from SMS to another school. This action would have resulted in an unacceptable amount of disruption more than five weeks into the school year. Sixth grade is already a very difficult and emotional transition for students. And to make this sort of a change with less than a week's notice would be detrimental to the children, faculty, and staff of the school. Not only would the students in the transferred teachers' classes be affected, but all other students would have had multiple schedule changes, a sudden influx of extra peers into their well-established classes, and stressed out teachers with new teaching blocks assigned to their already busy schedules. The teacher in question also teaches the honors sections, and my understanding was that if she had been moved, there would have been no honors ELA at SMS. Thankfully, our school community took swift action and dozens of parents and students, which is very impressive, wrote letters opposing the personnel action. I understand that JCS has to balance their budget. I really do truly understand that. But JCS is not a business, it's a school system. And the number one priority must always be social, educational, and emotional needs of the students. We're very happy to hear um, through Dr. Gibson's second letter that there's board support for creating the position at CTMS. Um, and I know that I speak for many parents who feel the way that I do. Making changes this late in the school year should be avoided at all costs. And under enrollment personnel action should be completed earlier in the calendar year. I understand that the omnibus bill passed earlier this year allows for this sort of mid-school year staff deploy redeployment. But just because we can do something doesn't mean we should do something. I urge the board to implement a policy requiring personnel transfers due to under enrollment to be implemented prior to the summer before our new school year begins. I know that over enrollment can occur at any time and can be very unexpected, but under enrollment is a different situation where JCS knows ahead of time that a particular incoming class is unusually small or enrollment has dropped for various reasons. Um, I just want to thank all of you, um, board members and JC JCS staff, for your dedication and your unwavering support and efforts to meet the needs of all children in our district. Thank you. Now we're down to number 12, unfinished business, of which there is none. So number 13A, action on approval of sewer line easement at Shepherdstown Middle School. Um, yes, ma'am, we received a request for an extension of the existing easement um, by, uh, I think it's approximately eight feet <laughs> that they need to be able to um, complete some work to, for the functionality of that because the easement uh, has to be granted from the board for an approval. It will not disrupt anything on uh, 
uh, campus. It's not within the um, scope of our athletic fields or our, it's on our property, but it's outside of uh, what we have um, boundary markers for children. So there won't be any disruption to our instructional program. Is there a motion to approve the sewer line easement at Shepherdstown Middle School? So moved. Mm -hmm. Second. And my understanding from what I read that they would be obviously responsible to fix anything if any happens. Yes, ma'am. Absolutely. Under the same terms as the board. Uh, I can't remember it was more than a decade ago yeah, did the original easement yeah it's like way back uh, yeah. they did the original easement and under those terms they are responsible for any disruption they have to replace the the dirt and the grass and you know make it back as it was my concern is the fencing uh, that goes around the football field mm -hmm. um, this easement appears to be pretty close to that so we need to be sure that if the fencing's disturbed that they're responsible for taking care Yes, sir. I will make sure that's it. it. Their responsibility for any alteration of JCS property is in there, but I'll make it put explicit in the letter that that, of I mean, course, it, you understand that's the fencing. Yes, the sir. easement appears to be pretty close it to is. that fencing. Yes, mm -hmm. sir. It's on the outside, but it's still there. Yes, sir. Well, it's about a six foot drop off there. It the the, it's going to be really tight. Yeah. Right. If we were to drag that trailer on top of that easement, would they have to move it out of the way? <laughs> just, just asking. Oh, oh, oh thank hey, Brandon, you so how, much. how quickly can you make that happen? <laughs> that, that, that one's moving Friday. Yep. Yeah, I'll be there. Okay. <laughs> All right. So we have a motion to approve the approval of the sewer line easement at Shepherdstown Middle School. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? All right. 13B, fiscal year 2019 unaudited financial statement presentation. Good evening. Good evening. Board members. Um, some housekeeping first. Um, the large packet is the full financial, unaudited financial statement, and it includes the management discussion analysis, notes, and all of the um, fund statements and district wide statements. The second, now, two things were already in your packet. The second um, packet that you have is what will be published and is required to be published in the, the newspaper which is about one-tenth of the actual um, financial, uh, unaudited financial statements. And just so that I can disclose the document that was published with vendors, we're required to publish all vendors over 250. The one that went to the board agenda, I actually picked up last year's, so if they looked familiar to some people, which a lot of our vendors are the same, the amounts may be different. The document that you have in front of you, the document that you'll see in our spirit coming up next week, will have fiscal year 19 expenditures versus fiscal year 18. I apologize for that um, mishap. <laughs> Tonight we are here to discuss fiscal year 19, which is last fiscal year's um, unaudited financial statements and review at a high level the revenue and expenditures um, in closing out our fiscal year. I wanted to start with talking about revenue um, and making sure that we understand that what we're looking at is a final budget, not the original adopted budget. This would be the adopted budget plus any budget supplements or transfers that have occurred over the fiscal year 19 um, school year. And we are comparing that budget to what our actual data came in at when we closed our books. Um, as you can see, our revenue came in and exceeded our, our uh, projections by 1.4, almost 1.5 million. The majority of that coming from Medicaid, and if you look at the footnote below, Medicaid changed in 2015. Our state redesigned and hired a third party to um, re- uh, allocate how we uh, do our reimbursements. We have been tracking and trending that data over the past five years. 
um, although it seems significantly high, it's about a half a million to 600,000 lower than what it was before the state made the change. Um, this year uh, we are caught up and the majority of that uh, exceeding budget line item of 750,000 is based on an estimate that I booked this year for fiscal year 19 at 800,000, um, which is a conservative number, but I think given the data and the history, it, I'm confident that we will receive that and we won't know for another 30 days once they reconcile the data. Our taxes exceed at collections by $380,000 and the board is familiar with taxes. We've been trending that data or I've, I've been trending it for 15 years and this year it came in at 100.91% which is $379,000 above what we projected and is a pretty good um, or it made me happy to come in at that, uh, uh, at that number. Now I will say I had a discussion with Dr. Gibson this week and currently we have a, a bad debt collection of 6% and we have had that um, collection rate for three years. And in the past three years we have had slightly higher than the 100% and I think that we may look at for 21 uh, lowering that to 5.5% giving us a portion of that $379 um, dollars at budget time versus at the end of the budget season or at the end of the actual season. Miscellaneous income is increased by $372,000 which is always nice. There are a couple factors that are filtering into that. One and the most significant is that we bank as our primary bank at Jefferson Security Bank and as a secondary at the Bank of Charlestown. And two things were recently implemented over the past 18 months, and that is our interest, well, naturally interest rates have been going up with uh, the economy the way that it is. But we implemented, uh, old school wording is called a sweep account. Uh, I think they refer to it now as an ICS account, which means every night the bank sweeps our money into a higher interest bearing uh, account and then they sweep it back in. And that doesn't sound like a lot. Um, they benefit it because they don't have to pledge our securities and they have to pay a lot of money for that. That actually increased our interest by about $15,000 a month. So the budget for 19 didn't reflect that increase. The budget for 20 reflects a good, a good bit of that increase. Um, and of course it'll be tied to the um, economy, but that the school uh, systems rate, for anybody who's interested, it was 0.25 of the federal funds is now at 0.34. Um, currently it is sweeping on, or it's compounding monthly. And I just had a meeting with them this week saying that we would like to see it compound daily. And so we'll be discussing that over the next couple years. Um, health insurance, uh, you can see that the revenue collected was slightly below. Um, part of that is due to the way that the state does the allocation. For every other allocation in the system, they look two years back to give us money, uh, with the exception of our PEI revenue that they allocate to us, and they do a sizing up mid-year. And it, depending on the number of insureds, depends on what that collection comes in as far as budget to actual. Um, any questions on revenue? How will the changes in the formula this year um, affect us in Jefferson County? Okay. Which percentage of the share? Okay, House Bill 206, I will tell you, we just recently got guidance within the last week. Um, and I know I'm getting a lot of questions, one even just this evening, to say we're getting $4.7 4 million extra. And, and that partly is true. However, part of that, $2.6 million, or, or roughly half of that, is for salary increases. And those salary increases only cover the people that are within the formula. So the state doesn't really help people understand that. and. So we'll be adding 15% to that to cover, or roughly 15% to cover what our portion is. And the, we will have a lot more flexibility. So they've taken a lot of restrictions 
off of that money. And I think when we had the board retreat, I estimated about 2.2 .2 extra million dollars um, that will come towards us from House Bill um, 206, I think, was, is it House Bill 206? Yeah, with House Bill 206. Um, however, I haven't had a chance to really look through and what that means. Um, what I would say is the finance person standing up here is, yes, I believe we will be getting that extra $2.2 million. In the bigger picture, we've been losing enrollment, and we're waiting for our second month enrollment to come. So it will help us, and as far as a line by line, I think maybe in November, I would be more prepared to speak to it in more detail. I, I've been asked about a block grant and things of that nature, which I am not familiar with, nor have I received guidance on it. So. That's all I can tell you at a high level. But by the time next month comes around, I'll be able to tell you in detail because we have to make a lot of adjustments for the changes. Expenses. Final budget in comparison to our actuals. Um, I'm going to highlight some of the um, significant changes, uh, give you the data that I have so you have an understanding. Salary contracted um, sometimes confuses people. That doesn't mean we contract contractors. But when you work for a school system and you're a regular employee, employed with benefits on a full-time basis, you have a contract. And that contract is the salary line item for both our service and our professional. And you can see that we had a variance of 1.2% between our final budget and our actuals at uh, close to a half a million dollars. That is due to positions that we could not fill or positions that were partially filled. I think um, that I'd like to see that number under 1%, and I think that with some new tracking mechanisms and certainly with our new Chief Human Resources Officer, it will be easier to get that budget to actual a little closer um, with our contracted salaries. Um, Employer benefits, which is a really big one and one that I had to delve pretty deeply in to see because uh, $900,000 is a significant variance. Um, I can tell you that half of that is coming from our PEIA line item and the other half is coming from retirement. Um, and I wanted to talk about both of them just individually. PEIA, I, can, I had to consult with our benefit coordinator that it has trended uh, with even with the unfunded uh, OPEB, which are other post-employment benefits that our retirees receive in lieu of uh, with their sick days that they can use them for health insurance. We saw a drop in um, health insurance premiums of $400,000 this year. Um, and it, it's not quite explained. I can tell you this, that we have dropped 40 positions that are funded with health insurance and seen a decline in it. As far as total cost between what your regular premiums are and what your retiree portion is, they've stayed pretty much the same. So at this time, the only explanation we have is that people are, well, Part of it is that when the economy is good and people have other options for insurance, they take the best option. And sometimes that means that our spouses may be choosing, or our uh, employee spouses may be choosing the opposite insurance. Um, Shelby and I are still looking at that. I don't feel comfortable enough to change the budget um, for one year. If we see that cycle over two or three years, then I would be inclined to lower that. Um, particularly with ACA, the Affordable Health Care Act, and people have the option to take our insurance regardless of whether they're employed full-time and working over a certain amount of hours, they can look back in a look-back period and still pick up that health insurance. Um, the retirement, Retired 2 offers a forfeiture and every five years they send us a check for people who have left our system and stay gone and not returned within a five-year period. The employer match to that system comes back to us. For fiscal year 19, it was $100,000. The other $350,000 is that we are seeing, even with a pay increase, a trend downward from the higher paid employees, which we call our retire one employees, who when they were originally with our system and still today, 
we match for any supplemental pay and their contracted salary, the employer matches at 15%. The newer retirements, and even though it's the old new retirement, employers are now only matching 7.5%. So as you see, the more senior people leave and your newer people come on, it will trend that retirement down slightly. Um, for impacting fiscal year 20, I'm still only looking at about $150,000 that we may, from the trend data, be able to uh, lower for the budgeted amount in um, fiscal year 20's um, data. Uh, Non-salary is basically grouping our programs and our departments into uh, expense line items. You can uh, look at professional and technical services. This is really, truly where your contract expenses would be. And that fluctuation is primarily due to, believe it or not, special education. Um, and that is hiring. We had hired some uh, speech and OT and PTs throughout 19 and shifted them more to a salary line item versus a contracted line item. Uh, other services include special ed again, but that is for students who are receiving education services outside of our school system. And even though we did supplement the budget, we had a few uh, concerns at year end that we didn't get a supplement in before the end of the year and it overran by $60,000. Um, supplies, electric and diesel. Um, I can tell you that for the last four years, our electric, even though we were growing, um, had flatlined. And last year we did increase the actual budget by $200,000, and the actuals did not come in at a higher number. I haven't delved into that with Brian and it, or Brandon. I know he keeps some data on that. But when we come back for carryover supplements in October, we will be, look, be looking individually at those actual line items to see if we can determine um, if there's an adjustment needed for fiscal year 20's budget. Um, also, supplies came in favorably at 170000 That would mean departments across all the school systems did not expend their supply line item by year end. Um, some of them, for example, the contracted services, if there were POs open at year end, they would not be hitting the actuals. And you'll see on a couple slides from now that our encumbrances at this year end were higher than normal. Um, other than that, the transfer line item is actually due to child nutrition. At year end, we look at the revenue and the expenses, and we transfer enough to allow the revenues to equal the expenditures. And this year, we had um, less than a full transfer in the last month, meaning that our revenue was up for child nutrition in fiscal year um, 19 compared to the expenses that they had. The contingency in the reserve looks like a good number. It's a half a million dollars. It did start out at 1.2 million, so there were some situations that um, we had during the year that we funded. And uh, 450 of it was a contingency, 762,000 was a reserve for unforeseen that the uh, leadership team has in order to um, handle um, some of those things. Sometimes we have a student that moves in that may need additional services that we didn't anticipate. Those are the type of things that we fund through um, that reserve account. Any questions on expenses? 419 in comparison to budget? I have two questions. Okay. Um, one has to do with going back to revenue. Mm -hmm. Just um, to clarify so I know where we are, to put this on who this is as well. Okay. So obviously we get some funding. We're looking at getting a little bit more funding. We know that over half of it's going back out immediately due to um, the you know, funding pay raises Correct. and whatnot, but obviously a little deserved, but that the legislature does not cover, which is difficult for people to understand, that does not, you can't run a school system with what they think that you, Correct. you wouldn't have a job as well, I don't right. know who would have to manage all the money, I don't know how they do that in some of those smaller counties. Um, but the other piece of that then as well is we have had reports, am I correct, that 
um, the projected revenue from the state is not as good as it was expected. And how much can you remind me, did we get cut in years past when all of a sudden, miraculously, we ended up getting budget cuts in our school system after we've already passed a budget? So when you lose enrollment, and it's something that we're not as familiar with until fiscal year 19, and we did lose 130 kids back to back from a loss of approximately 30. So what that does to your state aid is it decreases the amount of state aid that you have with no offsetting increase. And we lost, I, I think it was over a million dollars in state aid due to the enrollment decline. Um, so is, is that it, answering your question? Is quite, it a I'm, fair assessment, I guess is what I'm saying, is it a fair assessment that even though we may have quote unquote around two million, it's a fair assessment to say by October 1st when we get the second numbers for enrollment, we may be down another million dollars and need to supplement that. If our, if our October 1st enrollment is a decline, then when we do the projections for fiscal year 21, they will look at that second month enrollment number and yeah, we will have a decrease in state aid from that decline in, in student enrollment. And then $65,000 that we approved tonight for a position will also come out of that. That, that $65,000 that you approved tonight will probably come the second, it will come with our carryover. It will probably be a line item to say we need to supplement that position. Um, that's, that we'll do it with our carryover. Just because I know about it and our carryover comes in the second month in October, you'll also see an allocation. Um, Mr. I think it was Mr. Osborne who asked about the rate, uh, track and football field replacement. Um, that we did not fund at budget time because at the budget time we're trying to maintain positions and we did not include that in there. So you'll see that as a line item as a carryover also to, so that we can start that fund based on the direction of the board wanting to make sure we have a $100,000 allocation over the next 10 years so that when we have um, major expenditure that we have prepared for it. How much was the cut from the state that we had to experience? The last before? one I remember was 450 in the middle of the year. Um, and if I also remember correctly, we took that out of a reserve and we did not cut it any. Twice. It was back yes, to back. it was in back the to back. Two years here, we got cut $450,000 in the fall, I think it was November, that they sent us the notice because their revenue didn't meet projections. And uh, we had a meeting with a, uh, a House representative. Um, from the panhandle and they conveyed that their uh, revenue was not meeting the projections that they put forth which is kind of a always a scary thing for us um, so. I thought I had remembered that being two years in a row it was two years in a row 15 16 and 16 17 yes and that had nothing to do with student enrollment that mm -hmm. was just no state projections. that was just right. projections. State projections that wasn't right. the that if that happens, that would be on top of the million plus for lower student enrollment. Yeah, and um, just and for the people who already know and don't know what they so the state aid the way they fund school systems if it's in the formula for funding they can't cut it, which that makes them feel better about cutting us. But what they do is they cut grants that we have programs running. So if I remember correctly, they cut our early literature grant mid-year and took back even money we had already spent in one of those back-to-back -back cuts. And they can, they can pull that money back because it's not within that formula, but not understanding that we've already got commitments and programs running that impact our uh, students. Um, I know that for our county, because this board does have that reserve and they also have that designated account that helps us sometimes manage those crises that we don't normally, and, and maybe it doesn't impact our employees when they have those cuts because we manage them here. And so they may not understand fully um, what we're doing to save the student instruction when we're making those cuts at the central office. And the last question I had was that contingency, have you looked forward, because part of the bill I know that it, and it's been a massive communication issue within the state is the um, 
open transfer. So when you were just talking about a uh, child comes into the county and we have to provide this or we have to provide that, um, I think we're going to have to look because it's July of 2020 that, that they want to implement that, but that would mean I don't like what I see in our neighboring county for special ed. I'm going to go to Jefferson County and there's nothing they can do about it and I'm coming with 10 kids and 10 new IEPs and 15 different devices and 10 new aids and it is not in the budget because the budget is done in April. Yeah. So. I haven't personally looked at it, but I can tell you I've participated in the conversation about it, and mm -hmm. I know Joyce and Dr. Gibson and Sean had that conversation and how we can translate to what that will or will not do and what we need to prepare for. And I don't want to simplify or paraphrase, but I think what we've decided is that we need to research that a little bit more and transportation and Dr. Gibson's has already had some conversations across county lines to say we'll have meeting points to reduce those expenditures and some conversation where out of state people do the same thing now. This is now just going to make it more difficult because it's contiguous counties, but it's something that we've already been challenged with from outside of our own state. Now it's going to be within. So I don't know if you can speak to that, Dr. Gibson. or. Um. You're correct. The open enrollment uh, is implemented July 2020, and currently the way that it's written, um, uh, a school system cannot place restrictions on other on uh, residency. Anyone who lives in Berkeley or, or Morgan. Um, Morgan, or Grant. if they were willing to transport them. The issue is that if they come here and enroll their students and they're out of the county, we do not have to provide transportation if they are general education students because federal law requires that special education transportation is part of their IEP. We do have to provide transportation from wherever those students live. So at our EPIC meeting, I've asked Sherry Barnett, which is a regional meeting with all eight counties, Eastern Panhandle and out to Hardy and Hampshire, for us to work on having in place far ahead of this some sort of agreement where we can designate meeting points between our counties where they'll bring students to the line and we'll bring them back. However, to your point, there is no refusal of enrollment based on the level of services that someone needs, which I completely agree with. I think ethically you have to do that. The issue comes in, the only way a county can uh, limit open enrollment is if you don't have uh, slots. Like, let's say, you know, legally uh, you can only have 23 kids in this classroom and the 24th uh, person, someone comes from Berkeley and says, I want to be in this class. We can say, no, I'm sorry, you can't be in that class. But they could, they could be in another one, anyone that isn't at or over enrollment. Now, some of, we have a lot of unanswered questions about, hey, we <laughs> get two questions. people who come from Berkeley and there's 23 people in there and we fill the class up and then someone actually moves in and they live here. Mm -hmm. Do we kick one of those folks out who aren't here? Do we tell somebody who moved here and pays taxes here that they can't put their kid in their neighborhood school? Um, it is a frustrating the state has not issued their guidance documents on it. Um, yet and uh, I would also point out that we don't get any local funds for those students. Basically none of Berkeley's uh, share of the per pupil comes over with them. We only get so second month enrollment is that's when it. they finish it and they look back. Yeah, and so Separate the state PEI. doesn't pay all of a child's educational costs. Right. If it costs $10,000 to educate a child in Jefferson, the state pays, what, $6,500, $7,000 of it, and then the locals are on the hook for the rest of it. So you get a lot of people who aren't local, we, still, we only get the state share. So if you spend anything over the state share, you're going to spend it on them too, from local dollars. So it's... I think it was very well intentioned because parents, um, I think they should all get a quality education for the child and they should do, I would too, I would go anywhere that I had to to make sure that my son got the best education possible. 
but I think there are a lot of financial and logistical things that they didn't think through before they made that decision. And we have to get a lot more information in order to be able to budget we do. accurately. It yeah. could be rather significant, I'll say that. Particularly given, and I, I love Berkeley, I mean, no disrespect <laughs> if there's any Berkeleyans here, but the difference between our academic performance um, our scores, our awesome teachers is just, I think it will be very attractive to the people who are able to provide transportation or whose condition allows them to get free transportation. Well, how does that work too? I mean, obviously we can't, um, you know, violate an IEP, we have to go get them. But I'm thinking to myself, okay, if I have to transport a child back, even if a child's back to the line, I already don't have enough buses for extracurricular that I need. Mm -hmm. So now Joyce is going to have to come say, oh, hey, by the way, bus driver A gets to drive all the way back to Berkeley or Morgan or some line, you know, way over there. And no, we can't pick up this team to get them over to Berkeley Springs until 430. So now they're not going to get there till 6 because I don't have enough right. buses mm -hmm. to be able to do bus, that. Or bus drivers. Or bus drivers. Mm -hmm. Yes, that is true. Yeah. We will always choose getting kids to and from school and their actual academics before extracurriculars. I mean, I, I, I love it. extracurricular as much as anybody else, but that's true. And it may result in purchase of more buses, hiring more bus driver positions. We we just don't know. It's speculation at this point. It, it is, and, and I don't know if this comforts you or if it's about the budget, but very similar with special education needs. We take all the data that we have when you adopt that budget and we know what we have. If we have a student that moves in that increases that cost, at that point is when we get together and address it. And if the reserve or the JLT reserve uh, can't handle or absorb that cost, we still have our contingency that we set aside in that adopted budget that we could then get the board to uh, approve that transfer. And it, it, we won't have trend data. Like after three or four years, if that goes into place, what we will know is every year approximately this amount of money seems to be what we're spending for that type of movement. But initially, we budget for what we have as it comes in. If it's going to be um, excessive or something that we can't accommodate, it's going to be communication. And I don't want to say that at that point we would have to cut, but if it became the worst case scenario, we already monitor what we have and we know that we have. So when something additional comes in, then we assess the amount that it's going to take. And if we can't tweak a few things or hit our reserve and our contingency, then we would have to ha start having conversation for what do we need to cut or where do we need to go in order to accommodate the request. Well, I guess it would just be my thought if you could help keep that in our forefront that, you know, if we do have anything extra left after we, you know, get a raise that we don't really get because <laughs> it's all going back out anyway um, by our needs, that we may need to increase that funding if that's the only place we're going to have to get it because we won't even know that they could come after October 1st with that and we won't even get our Correct. own dollars. Mm -hmm. So all of the funding for that student from October 2nd through the whole rest of the that's year correct. would have to come somewhere. We have to educate them. So Correct. And it won't be funded. So yes. they will have been funded for a student they don't have. Mm -hmm. And we we have nothing or vice versa right right I'm right and it's the net too. of the total of that those two and seeing where it it, it does fall out in the trend data uh, retirement is a, a good example or not retirement the um health insurance 7.1 million 7.1 million for two years in a row 6.7 million this year so that data and delving that data won't change what we do unless we have a pattern or can decipher, is it related to ACA? Is it truly that our economic choices are allowing our employees to, to piggyback on their spouse's insurance because it's better insurance? It, it's, we'll probably will reserve a little bit extra, but until it happens, um, I would like to say that we're going to reserve a little bit extra, but it t depends on when we pull everything together what those revenue comes in versus what those expenditures because we got another back-to-back -back raise right. and so that back-to-back -back, they do fund it but 15 percent of that you know which 
fifteen percent of seven hundred thousand is not a small chunk of change back to back that we still have to come up and accommodate so that everybody gets that that raise. So. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Fund balance. Um, uh, fund balance. I have both the numbers and a chart for you, just that we've tracked it. It is less OPEB. OPEB's no longer required to be on the books as of fiscal year 18. Um, you can see that uh, we dropped about um, 800,000 um, before any commitments. And that means that our revenues minus our expenses, adding in our transfers in and outs, were negative 800,000. Um, what does that mean? That's our general operating fund. All our other, other funds are self-balancing. It means that um, after we have um, our balance and we take our commitments for what we know that we've got to commit to in fiscal year 20, um, we have a leftover or unassigned balance of, of $3.7 million. Um, and that sounds like a lot, especially if you're not looking at the data or taking in the consideration of the whole picture. It's like, hey, you have $3.7 million and you're complaining about a $65,000 teacher, which is what the next slide is. And that's the data and the trend of that data over, over the years, particularly the decrease in our excess levy, which the board I know is familiar with, our public may not be as familiar with, but the decline in... Um, our excess levy and our assessed values in 2012, um, we are still collecting less on our excess levy than what we did in 2012. It's steadily increasing, but that drop in three years was 25%. It increases 1% to 2% on an annual basis. So with a $3.7 million carryover and some commitments that we know we already need to make, um, and looking at what we adopted in fiscal year 20, Outside of our regular revenues and our regular expenditures, we did have two commitments, one from board designated and one from our prior year carryover in order to balance our budget, totaling $3 million. Um, this point, even with um, HVIL 206 and a decline in revenue, I see that being about the same for fiscal year 20, barring um, some great revenue source that would come through or some decrease in expenditures. Um, having a reserve or enough funding in order to uh, commit to that balance in those additional funding sources is definitely a, a blessing that this board has blessed over the years, which is this page. Board designated funds, board designated from the annex sale and the table referendum funds and the impact fees. Um, funding sources that are some assigned by the Board of Education, some um, by the county, the impact fees are by the county uh, and um, we received some money back from that. So our board designated funds began at 2.4 million, um, collected when it says collection, it actually means that the pre previous year end, our carryover of 4.8 after our commitments and the things we needed to do for the current year, the board uh, chose to assign 3.9 uh, 3 million into the board designated account. The drawdowns, 1.7 million helped you balance your budget uh, budget in 19, if you looked at the adopted budget, the board designated contributed 1.7 million in order to balance the 19 budget. The additional 750 was what the board contributed to the Washington High School track and Jefferson track and uh, Washington field. Um, the annex sale was 2.4 million. The board did uh, some early lit um, the year before bringing uh, it was around 84 94,000 this year that 716 coupled with with the above board designated of 1.4 million was for the high schools um, still leaving a, a pretty nice balance in that account that may not be used without the board releasing the designation table referendum I will highlight this this year you can see we collected one point almost nine million sounds like a lot of money. Well, it was $4.8 million when we first started with table collections before National Harbor opened their casino. So if you look at the drawdowns, those drawdowns are commitments. Uh, one is $1.9 million that transfers from table referendum into the general fund to assist all departments, mostly maintenance, um, technology, and transportation with capital expenditures, some instruction, but not a whole lot. Um, and our 
uh, bus garage lease revenue bond. You can see the difference between those two. Um, and fiscal year 20 was the first year that we decreased the transfer from 1.9 million to 1.8. The next three years, we will be decreasing that by $100,000 a year in order to align the collections with what our commitments are. Um, so just little things like that, keeping in mind with the picture that we're gonna lose $200,000 worth of table referendum money that transfers into general fund because we're not collecting uh, to what our commitments are, um, or just as the whole picture comes in with House Bill 206, at the end of 21 when we're doing that budget, we'll see if there is money left over to put in another reserve for unforeseen commitments more than what we already do. Um, I put the uh, 408 funding there because, not this year, but in the past years, I know every year since Dr. Gibson has been here, it's been a conversation. There are only eight counties in the state of West Virginia that receive those funds. I think we've received seven, eight million dollars over the years that it has been here. Uh, it used to be a million dollars. You can see in fiscal year 18, that was a peak because we had a lot of infrastructure in Jefferson County where they were doing water lines and sewer lines. It was a one time but still 250000 that Brandon has as additional funds to expend with his maintenance and repairs for the school system. Any questions on our additional revenue sources? They don't sit within our general fund, but they help our general fund operate. So I always like to make sure that you have uh, what we started with, what we did with it, and what we end it with. Other than that? And I, I guess... So that pretty much at the end, the last picture we see is what we have, if anything, to put towards uh, all these different transfers we may get. Um, the the three point seven implementation, a yeah. sixteen million dollar school that needs to replace one that's old. Yes. I mean, I don't see that as. The 3.7 at this point is unassigned and the second, the second board meeting in October we typically come back with what the department needs that may be coming that we didn't anticipate when we adopted in May. And what the board has traditionally done is taken the remainder of that and assigned it to the board designated account. Um, which right now says 3.8 million I think if we look at, I didn't. So it's 3.8 million, but I'm gonna reduce that by 2.5 million, and then the transfer will increase it again, just so you have the logistics of it. Thank you. I'm sorry. I forgot for just a second. I was like, oh. Yes, ma'am, we do. Okay. Yes, well, it's personnel well, action. action. Yes, ma'am. Okay. All right. So do we. I blanked for a minute. You sure did. <laughs> <laughs> it was a blank look. I remember now. So do we have a motion to go into executive session for action on an HR request? Mm -hmm. All in favor? Aye. All right. Thank you very much.